just so you guys know what we'll be talking about tonight. <clears throat> and we'll be talking about sex and dating. Specifically, though, specifically, though, what we are going to delve into is homosexuality, fornication, and adultery. I am going to delve into each of these topics tonight. <clears throat> And I'm going to kind of give you an extensive definition of them. We're going to talk about some signs of each. We're going to talk about soul ties. It's almost impossible to not, that's right, be present and praying. Uh, it's impossible to talk about homosexuality, fornication, and adultery without talking about soul ties. So we will, um, many of us have gone through the teaching of soul ties, but you know that you can never hear it enough. That is something that is a topic that you must continue to relearn because we are continuously building soul ties. I don't care if it's an emotional soul tie. I don't care if it's a sexual soul tie. We all got soul ties. We're all knitted together with something. I want to give you this scripture tonight. I will not be before you long. Um, I, will, I do want to give an opportunity to ask questions if you have them, but 1 Corinthians 6, 9, 10 through 9, 6 and 9 through 11, we're going to talk about this. I love to, to talk about, we must um, start with the scripture, start with the scripture, start with the scripture. What does the scripture say? So it says, or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral. And remember, guys, that this is discipleship class. This is not a condemnation class. I need you to just say to yourself, there is therefore now no condemnation, but we're here to learn. We're here to learn. So the scripture says, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 reads, it says, or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. It says, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. I want to go back to that because I want to delve into this here. So it says neither the sexual. So what this scripture is telling us that there is a group of people, people who, who enter into willful, unrepentant sin. That's something that to, to take a key here or stick a pin in that people who live habitually unrepentant sinful lives will not inherit the kingdom of God. It says not the sexually immoral, nor the idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men. So that particular text there is talking about homosexuality. We know that gen this is not a gender specific. So nor men who have sex with men, or even nor women who have sex with women, nor thieves, nor greed, nor idolaters shall inherit the kingdom of God. But then it goes on to say, there's good news after that. I need you to say good news comes after that. It says, but you were washed and you were sanctified and you were justified by the, na by the name of Jesus. It says, and such were some of you. So what Paul is saying here is that you were once in this lifestyle. You were once an adulterer. I was a once a fornicator. I was once an adulterer. But then it says, but you were washed and you were sanctified. That's the good news is that you were washed and sanctified and you you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of God and by the spirit of God. So you were justified going down to verse 15. I want to read this. It says, do not know. Do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her, one body with her. So to delve into this subject called soul tide, it says that when you enter into a covenant of sexual activity with a person in this particular text is talking about a prostitute but this particular text that's for that particular time but when we talk in modern day times it's saying when you are joined with anyone you become one flesh with that person that's where the term soul ties come now now you may ask well i've never seen soul ties in the scripture you will not find that term in scripture but the principle of soul ties exists in the scripture it 
it exists. That why, that's why the Bible says in Genesis 2 and 24, may you leave your, your father and your mother and cleave to your cleave to your wife. It says, may you become one. It says, when they came together, they were one. So uh, the original intent for God, intent of God was that people would be joined together with their husbands and their wives, enter into sexual intercourse for the first time and become one with them. Have you ever met a couple that said they finished each other's sentences? That's a result of a godly soul tie. So you know that you have a godly soul tie, one when you're married, with the opposite sex. You know that you have a godly soul tie when you're married to the opposite sex and you got your souls are knitted together. You think you think the same thing. You have the same spiritual, you have the same spiritual DNA. You have you have you have similar ways of doing things. You know each other. You know what makes each other tick. So when that 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 um you can have a soulmate uh, literally by way of this by way of explaining soul ties but you can have a soulmate that's not of God. And so when you have a godly soul tie, you literally are knitted together by the by the God ordained covenant that he told you to have, right? So when we talk about soul ties, you're literally becoming one. Now, I don't want to delve into homosexuality, fornication and adultery just yet because I want you to understand that you can create soul ties in each of these entities. Fornication, you can create a soul tie. Adultery, you can create a soul tie. Homosexuality, you can create a soul tie. You can create a soul tie. So now I want you to learn this. First six, first Corinthians six, 15, no, first Corinthians six and 18. What it says, it says, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin is a man can commit. Every other sin a man can commit is outside of his body. So what I want you to get from this, every other sin that you commit. So when you cuss and when you go off on somebody, and even when you steal and you get drunk, all of those sins are outside of your body, which means they don't impact your internal being. It is an outside of your body sin. But when you have a sex outside of marriage or when you enter into sexual sin, that is the only sin that is against your body. Scientifically speaking, scientifically speaking, I had to study this out. Scientifically speaking, when you enter into in when you enter into sexual sin, it impacts your brain negatively. You are literally your brain is not designed to engage in a covenant outside of marriage, in a sexual covenant without outside of marriage. Your brain is not designed to do that. I'm going to tell you the two the two hormones that are released when you engage in sex, when you watch when you watch pornography outside of marriage, when you engage in adultery, when you engage in homosexuality, what happens? Literally, this is a hormone that is released. It is called vasopressin. Vasopressin. And it is a it is a it is a medicine and a hormone that's released in your brain that is used in mammals to numb the pain. So if you wonder why you've done something so much and you become so numb to it, after a while you become numb to the activity because you've done it so much. Does that make sense? So you become numb to the very thing that you want to stop. That's why the Bible says that I want to do good, but evil is always present. I'm that, but see, that's why it's there because literally God knew he created the earth because he had a scientific mind in mind when he was creating us. He understood the function of the brain. Our brain was only meant to really hold sexual encounters with one person. He knew your brain would become confused if you added too many, if you added too many people to the mix. If you added too many people to the mix, it confuses you. So just imagine if you had one sexual encounter on Monday and then two months later, you had the love the, and then the oxytocin. Let's talk about the oxytocin. We talked about the oxytocin. So you have one sexual partner in January. And so that love hormone is released. And then you have another um, sexual encounter in March or April, then vasopressin and oxytocin is released. And then all of a sudden you don't know why you don't know who you are because you have confusion going on in the brain. 
God and the brain was only meant to handle that one being. Your spiritual being was only meant to handle one being, right? All right, so let's go down. So it says join together. Wow, well, where do we get this word soul ties from? Soul, soul, what is soul? Soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Your mind is where your intellect is housed. Your will, your emotions, where, you're, where, where you have feelings at. And so what happens, and I want to tell you about this, and I must make this connection between the brain and theology and biblical things because it will give you a greater understanding understanding of what happens in your life and in your body when you delve into certain um, when you delve into certain things when you delve into certain lifestyles this word so this word what happens in the limbic system your limbic system your which is a part of your brain that houses your emotions because I get this question all of the time. I remember I was talking to this guy when I was younger and I was like 18 or 19 and I tried to tell him about soul ties and I hadn't been, I hadn't become quite as, as astute as I am now in this subject of soul ties. And I tried to explain to him of, of, of you know, you can't sleep with all the women because you're going to have soul ties. And I definitely can't sleep with you because I don't want all them people that I don't want your count to become my count. Trying to explain to him. And he said, well, no, because I ain't attached to no woman like that. I'm not attached to women like that. I can have sex and forget about them the next night. That's what he told me. So in my mind, I'm like, well, dang, how do I, how do I rationalize it? How do I get through to him for a man that says, well, no, I have sex with a lot of people and I don't think about them no more. The reason that is, is because the limbic system, which houses our emotions in the, in the female brain is much larger than the man's. It's, it's smaller. So though he may think that he's numb to it his brain is still retaining it but his emotions tells him something different his emotions tell tells him that he's detached from the sexual activity where our emotions tells us that we're attached to it his limbic system that means that portion of his brain is much smaller so really he, he's really more deceived than the woman is because we have a sense of a, we have a sense of awareness but the fact that he does not have a sense of, or a man can lose a sense of awareness he'll keep doing it and doing it and doing it which means his spirit can become way more damaged much faster Faster than a woman because we have to stop and start. They don't have to stop and start. They can start and pick up and start again. So that's why the, and then the spirit of the man can become so desensitized to all of the women. So you want to know why the dog is in them is because the dog is innate in their being because their limbic system is small. They're not housed to hold the same level of emotion. Does that make sense? So what's happening? So just know, but still the woman and the man still holds this glue. There's still glue on us. So just as there is glue on me, he got up and he didn't have the same effect that it had, that it had on me, but glue is still on both of us. We're still glued together. You're still glued together. This word glue, so soul tie, that means you're knitted together. So you, you may not know a person, soul, you may not know them. You may not have gotten to know them well, but you, your mind, will, and your emotions connected to that person. You may have had a, so what does that look like? You may have had a one night stand, but you still left up with a, an attachment. You still have an attachment. There's still a union there. Literally in the spirit, sex is recognized in by marriage. So literally you've had sex with many people, though you don't have a wedding ring to prove it. All right, so moving down, I can't stay there too long. So that's the, the, the soul tie. I wanted to lay that foundation because literally what happens is we get into relationships and we create these soul ties. Now, what happens too, we can create emotional soul ties because soul ties, I don't want to leave you thinking that soul ties are only created by way of, um, by way of physical, of, of sexual activity because I don't have to have intercourse with you to gain a soul tie. I can talk to you all night because that oxytocin is still being released in my brain and it is building a connection between our brains. 
Does that make sense? So I may not have a sexual soul tie, but I can have an emotional soul tie because we have talked and talked and talked. And you have told me about your mama, family, your mama family and your daddy family. You told me how you almost wanted to kill yourself last week. And we talked about your deep hurts and you talked about my deep hurts. And we talked about what I wanted to do and what I wanted to eat and what my favorite food was and my favorite color was. And all the while, you just getting all of these stars in your brain. And it builds an emotional tie because again, remember soul ties is mind, will, and emotions. You can even have a soul tie with a physical place, something that you can't let go. You're so glued to it. Even if, and let's go even beyond sexual encounters. Some people have ungodly soul ties with their parents. Some people have ungodly soul ties with their family members. They, your family members have such a hold on your mind, will, and in your emotions. You can't make a decision on your own to save your life. Here you are, 45 years old, and never made a decision on your own. That is an ungodly soul tie to your parents. Huh? It's an ungodly soul tie. That means they have the ability to control your intellect, control what you do, control what you say. It is a soul tie. You can have an ungodly soul tie to a physical location. I can't leave this place. Do you know? You, I can't leave this place. I can't go beyond this place. I have to stay. I'm, 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 I'm held back in this particular area, in this location, because I have a soul. My soul is tied down. an unhealthy dependency on a person, place, or thing. Even a friendship, you can have a, a friendship, two friends, two girlfriends, me and my best friend, we could have an ungodly soul tie. If I can't move without her, if I can't make a decision without her, if I have to call her about every single thing, she controls my life. There's a spirit of manipulation and control in our relationship. She dominates me, I dominate her. That is an ungodly soul tie because the mind, will, and the emotion are tied down. God only meant for your spirit and your soul to be unto him. When there is a godly soul tie, like we say, like we see in the book of uh, uh, in the book of Samuel, I believe it is between David and Jonathan, there was a protection. You will see the godly thriving of God. If there is a, not a, and when you look at your relationships, and if you're thinking, well, let me let me examine my relationships. Is this relationship? Look at this. Do your do the friends that you have in your life? Do they keep you around by way of manipulation? If you don't do this. You should do this. If you say, I don't want to do this, they come back with five things why you should do this. And I'm not talking about anything godly. I'm not talking about they're holding you accountable. I'm saying that they use that to control your actions and control what you do. That is an ungodly relationship, an ungodly soul tie that has to be severed, if that makes sense. So I don't want to um, get into having these relate, um, or I don't want you to leave thinking that soul ties are just created by way of sex contact because they are not. They are not. When you have a godly relationship with a, with a friend or even your parents, there is a relationship of, or there is um, an organic relationship. There is no control. We talk, we discuss things. Um, we I don't have to call you and check in with you. And if, if you don't check in with me, I'm not mad with you because we ain't got that type of relationship. All right. So moving on, we don't have to stay there tonight, but that I, I did want to stick a pin there. Fornication is sex out, just in plain, simple words, it's sex outside of marriage, sex outside of marriage, fornication, sex outside of marriage. Genesis, I want to talk about this one. Um, the, the, when, when you, um, and we're going to talk about how to navigate if in fact you find yourself in one of these areas, um, in one of these areas, I, we will talk about how to, how to navigate through that and how to, um, come out of that. So let me give you some scripture here. I want to give you some scripture, um, Genesis. So we talked about first Corinthians. We've gone there. Um, let's talk about, uh, Give me just one second here. So fornication is, we talk about, going back to that 1 Corinthians scripture, it says in that scripture, do not 
join, do not have sex outside of marriage. Do not um, enter into sexual intercourse. Now, when you talk about, when literally, when you talk about sexual sin, it is nothing more than a, a form of idolatry. It is a form of idolatry. When you have sex outside of marriage, you enter into ungodly covenants. So that's, we can lay the foundation right there. I don't want to get too, um, I don't want to delve too much into um, that portion because we have more to cover tonight and it's already 7.58. So let's move down. Let's talk about, um, let's talk about the um, adultery. Let's talk about adultery. Adultery, having illegal intercourse with a married or a betrothed woman. According to scripture, adultery is having illegal intercourse with a married or a betrothed woman. That word betrothed means engaged. So if somebody is literally, have they have entered into um, an engagement or they are already married and you have intercourse with them, that is what we traditionally say is adultery. However, I don't want to stop there because adultery can, can it has some, um, it has some tears to it. So it's some tier one adulteries and then it's some tier two adulteries, but it's all adultery. Let's talk about tier one. Tier one is your visual adultery, visual adultery. So the Bible says, if you have lust for a person in your heart, you have, if you have lust, you have already committed adultery in your heart. So by way of the Bible, you don't even have to, you don't even have to enter into the act to have sex. You don't even have to enter into the act of sex to be considered adultery. The Bible says that you've already committed it, which means, and going back to this word of mind, will, and emotion, sin usually starts in the mind. If you can control what you think, you can control what you do and where you go. So it's in the mind. That's the visual adultery. If you're looking at people and you're looking at another uh, another man's wife or another, um, another woman's husband and you're saying, and you're wondering what it would be like to be with them not even sexually, if you're wondering what it would be like for them to be your man, you have entered into sin because it is a sin called covetousness. So but going beyond that, if you start imagining what your sexual experience would be like and how they would do it to you, even if you're looking at a celebrity, Huh? And you're looking at a celebrity and they marry, you didn't commit a visual adultery with them. Huh? Now, we all honest, we can put some names of people we didn't have visual adultery with. Just wonder, you know, what that would be like. So visual adultery. But one that I want to talk about a little bit more is emotional adultery. This is the one that gets us tripped up. And see, I'm not a novice. I ain't on here thinking that ain't nobody on here ever, ever considered or even or even barked on, barked on the doorstep of a married person. I know because you work in professional environments you go all out and I know married people are, are pursuing single people and so even if you have entertained it to a point where you have exchanged a text message you have almost embarked upon something that we call adultery so emotional adultery emotional adultery is when you have entered into a covenant an emotional covenant with somebody that does not belong to you they belong to someone else what's the song um who's saying that um I belong to someone else. I don't can't remember. Anyway, emotional adultery can occur when one person starts to share your personal thoughts, feelings, and emotions with another person other than their husband or their wife other than their husband or their wife. So, so just paint this picture. We at work, you know, we become good friends, you know, hey, hey, how are you today? You're doing well. And then day two, you start saying, oh, well, they say, well, what's wrong? I'm doing well. Well, you look sad. You don't look the same as you did yesterday. Well, um, you know, what, 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 can, what can I do? Is there anything I need? It start, anything you need, it starts out just like that. And then you start to say, well, you know, yeah, my, my husband forgot to pay a bill. He forgot to pay a bill. How he gonna do that? Now, this is the adulterer saying, how your husband gonna forget to pay a bill? Y'all both about to enter into adultery because you start, it, it is a, it's a downward spiral towards adultery. Adultery never tells you that it's coming because most times it is clothed in, it is, it is hidden in wolf's clothes. It's clothed in niceness. It's clothed in smoothness. And then it enters into a place where before you know it, they have become 
become the source of your of your confine or, your, or you started to confide in them as a source and before you know it you start to wonder what it would be like to be with them emotional adultery if not checked will always lead to physical adultery emotional adultery will lead you to the bed at all times And then what happens is you start to rationalize how nice they are. Well, they're, they're, they're really nice. Well, well we, we're just friends. And then what happens is that the text messages will come. Well, good morning. Now, you don't, if you're exchanging text messages, good morning and good evening text messages, you have already entered in a realm of emotional adul adultery. And so sometimes we get into the caveat of, well, I kissed him, but we didn't have sex or he or they fondled me, but I, I, I fondled them, but we didn't have sex. Like, remember the tears, you on that tear and a half of, of sexual adultery. You could you committed adultery already in your heart. And then what happens, and, and, and literally the enemy is crafty at adultery because he knows how to send a person right when at the brink of when there is chaos and confusion that may be taking place in the home. And what happens that, and that, that tie never tells you how long it's going to keep you. And then what happens on the, on the other side of the adultery, what happens when, when divorce starts to ensue, you'll convince yourself that you had nothing to do with that person's divorce. And they'll convince themselves that their marriage had problems way beyond you. But the portion of it is, is that the, 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 the caveat is that when the person is there, you create a distracting force that was never meant to be a part of that man or that woman's life. Here are some other examples of emotional adultery. Because remember, we're talking about soul ties tonight. When a conversation becomes about personal topics instead of just business, with the member with a member of the opposite sex who is not your spouse, discussing your marriage issues and problems with a person who is not your spouse, discussing your sex life or experience to a person who is not your spouse, conversations, and I, this ain't even in my notes, but conversations that span way beyond you as a, as a married couple, you have to, I, it's the same thing. You have to have your do's and your don'ts. So staying on the phone 20 and 30, 40 minutes talking about, I'm trying to cancel them. You got to have a, you have to have a closed door policy as a wife and a husband. A closed door policy. If my wife don't know you, I won't know you. If my husband don't know you, I won't know you. Now, when you feel attracted to a person's personality or looks and you do not cut off that stimulus, do you know we all have great, we all have stimuli. We all have things that stimulate us in a certain way. We ain't dead, but we are yet alive. And so when you recognize that you are entering into a place or you are moving into an environment where a person is there that stimulates you, then you need to have the, you, have, you must cut it off. Cut off the stimulus check. Cut off the stimuli. Cut it off. Anytime you have chemistry or unspoken attraction, I want to tell you this. If you have chemistry and an unspoken attraction to somebody that's not your spouse and you're already married, that does not mean that that's your long lost love. It don't mean that you made a mistake by marrying the one that you are currently married to. It does not mean that you're supposed to start exploring thoughts of the future with them if you leave the person you're with. I want to say that again. If you start to experience and you meet someone and you have a chemistry with them, you are currently married. That does not mean that's your long lost love or your soulmate that you should have met before you met your spouse. It is from the devil.
is of the devil. The devil loves to send cunning women and cunning men. It is the same thing as Delilah. There are Delilahs, there are male Delilahs and female Delilahs sent to take your husband or your wife off course. It's a plot of the enemy. And I'm coming after this because divorce is so rampant. We're talking about fornication, adultery, and homosexuality. Now we have to keep going because I have to get down a little bit more. Um, when you provide inappropriate so, uh, emotional support. Now this as a single person, if you are in a relationship with a married person, you must, you must, uh, you, you have to, you have to guard yourself of wanting to be a rescuer. You are not meant to rescue, nor are you to become a counselor to someone who's married. I, this is my this is my theology and my belief only. If you are a male, you need a male counselor. If you are a female, you need a female counselor. Even if they claim they really need your help. People in broken marriages gonna always need somebody's help. You're not the rescuer. You are not to bring their lunch. You are not to make sure they're having a good day. It is not your job to validate them and make sure they feel like a king or a queen. You're not the rescuer. Now, that's that emotional adultery. We know about the physical adultery. Any, any, okay, any forms of sexual activity. Any forms of sexual activity, whether there is stripping, even if you if you have stripped, if you have done anything in that relationship that was outside of the confinements of marriage with that person's spouse, it is adultery. It's adultery. We talked about visual adultery. Now let's talk about let's talk about homosexuality and lesbianism. I must lay this foundation and I'm going to go back a little ways. I'm going to go back a little ways. I want to talk about where this, where we get these terms called homosexuality and lesbianism, okay? These are all, all ways that we can start forming ungodly soul ties. It is sexual, it's what we call sexual immorality. If it's fornication, adultery, homosexuality, lesbianism, are all fall in, along the lines of sexual immorality. Now, when we talk about Jude, uh, Jude, let's read Jude 1 and 7. This is what the Bible says. This is what the Bible says. It says, in a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, in the Bible, homosexuality is actually referred to sodomites. It's, it is referred to sodomite. It means you sodomize, which means there is anal sex. It, is, it means that there is sex in, by way of the reptile. That's what that means, right? So it says in a similar way, Jude 1 and 7 says, in a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. The Bible says they serve an, as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire, of eternal fire. So we got that in the bag. We know that by way of scripture, scripture says, according to the Bible, that Sodom and Gomorrah, and going back, let's read this scripture in Sodom and Gomorrah, because I want to lay this foundation as well. Many of us know the scripture of Sodom, um, Sodom and the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, but I want to lay this foundation. Genesis 19, it says, and they called unto Lot, go back and read it when you have a chance, and they called unto Lot, Lot is a person, and said unto him, where are the men which came into thee this night? So this must be the King Keys James Version. What it's saying is, where are the men that came here this night? Where are, the, where are the men that came here tonight? That's what it's saying. Bring them out to us. So this is a, this is a, this is a, this is a group of men asking Lot to bring the men that visited you, bring them outside to us. And this is what they say. It says, and Lot went out at the door unto them. So Lot peeks out the door and shuts the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren, do not do so wickedly. He says, bring, this is what they tell him, bring them out to us that we may know them, that we may know them. That word knows means in this King James Version, the word knows means to have sex with them. I want to, I want to have, I want to enter into intercourse with them. And this is what Lot 
Lot says. This is what Lot says. He says, behold, now I have two daughters which have not known a man. He says, I'd rather give you virgins than to give you these men to have sex with. I'd rather give you virgins. I'd rather give you my own flesh and blood, the daughters that I have, my seed, than I, than I, would, than I would allow you to enter into this wicked behavior is what Lot says to them. And so moving down, so this is when we read Jude 1 and 7, when it is saying in a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah, that's what it's talking about. And the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality. So this is, so homosexuality is not new to the earth. It's been around. And it says they serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Now, Romans 1 and 26, it says, because of this, God gave them over to their shameful lust. So you're going to have to go back and read Romans. But this book of Romans 1, it says, because they would not listen, because they turned away from me, it says this, it says, because of this, God gave them over to their shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. This particular scripture is referring to lesbianism. It says, even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and they were inflamed, the Bible says, with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error, for their error. This is what this it says. It says it received within themselves, because remember that we said the, the, the sexual and moral sin is only, it's against the body. It's the only sin that's against the body. So it says it received within themselves the due penalty for their error. I want to pose to you that this particular lifestyle has a built-in penalty. There's a built-in penalty for this lifestyle according to scripture. And even for sexual, for the sexually immoral fornicators, adulterers, there is a built-in penalty. The Bible says that they will not inherit the kingdom of God. It does not say that they won't be saved. It does not say that they won't go to heaven. It says that they won't inherit the peace of God on earth. What's the kingdom of God? It is the peace of God that's within us that he gives us. It is the rewards that God gives us while we're here on earth. I believe that when we enter into such unrepentant lifestyles, habitual lifestyles, we, we neglect and we negate the rewards of heaven that God has for us on earth. Now, let's talk about the origin of homosexuality. I want to talk about this. It is where this came from is literally there were pagan worship, worship facilities dedicated to to homosexual intercourse. What happens in this, in this, what was going on is there was, there was worship unto the pagan gods. They were worshiping all spirits by way of entering into sexual intercourse together. So they would sodomize each other to worship the deity. First thing that we see with that, God does not condone idolatry when there is a worship of another God. So the root of homosexuality, the root of lesbianism is a portion, a level of idolatry where we get it, where it originated from the act of sodomy, the act of two men engaging in sex together is idolatry. I want to take this a step further. As I did my study, it is not the actual, this is not the only issue that God has with homosexuality. It is that God not only condemns the act of sodomy, he condemned because it is an alternate lifestyle and it cannot produce seed, it cannot reproduce, he, 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 he detests it because it mixes the male seed with fecal waste. So I want to say that again, it mixes the male seed with feces. That's why it is an abomination to God, which means when there is a mixture of the seed that God gave you in his body, he imparted his seed. He, he gave us the ability to reduce, produce life and we mix it with feces. It is death to the seed. The seed dies. It cannot produce life. 
So that's why God calls it an abomination. It is the only sin that mixes the seed, the sperm that God gave us with feces. He sees it as abominable because it is the mingling of human excrement. So what comes out of our, out of our bodies? This seed that was supposed to go one way and the other seed that was the other waste, the waste that leaves our body by way of toxins, we mix those together. God says, I never intended for you to live that way. He says, I never intended for you to live that way. That's God's issue. One of God's issues with homosexuality. And then we know the other issue is that it cannot create life. Literally, it creates death because it dies. And God does not, God does not, he does not, he's not the author of death. He's the author of life. So if there's a seed dying, he does not, oh, he does not condone that. The origin of lesbianism, let's talk about that. This name, Lesbos, this name, Lesbos, it is the name of a Greek island, a Greek island where an ancient poet called Sappho lived. Sappho is a female poet lived on this island who had a sexual relationship with the goddess Aphrodite. Aphrodite is the god of love. Two females living on this island, they engage in sexual intercourse. That began the spinning of lesbianism in the Western culture. Because what Sappho did, S-A-P-P-H-O, what Sappho did is that she would pull women in and teach them how to have sexual intercourse and intimacy by engaging in lesbian acts with them. It was never, and I wanna talk about the original intent of God. It was never God's intent for a woman to seduce other women, to teach them and to mentor them and teach them how to be married and be young ladies. It is a seducing spirit. It was interesting to me that Sappho connected with the God of love. It is also, and when you look about, when you think about the root of a lot of, when, when you think about the root of lesbianism, some homosexual and lesbian relationships, it is the root of rejection. So what Sappho does is she partners with the God called the God of love, Aphrodite. So she partners with this thing that she believes can love her. And when you have, when you do not deal with your need to be loved, you will leave open wounds for spirits to come and visit. Spirits that you were not even originally intending to live out of, and you will leave room for them. I'll give you another one. When a many, when 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 women do not have a nurturing mother or did not grow up with a nurturing mother in the home, they will look for other females to for, to perform that nurture or give them that new that that nurturing and make to in, to replace what they did not get. And what it starts, what it moves into, is a perverse relationship. So the issue, so the actual, the, and so going back to this, this text of Romans 1, Romans 1 says that they were given to unnatural lust. So when women engage in sexual relationships with each other, God says that is an unnatural way. I, I ordained for you to be fertile by, by I, 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 and I ordained for you to be fertilized by a man. I ordained for you to be loved by God first. And then I was to send you your God mate in, in the form of a man. And to in a form of a male species to love you and to go into you. And so he says it is unnatural, it is unclean, it is dishonorable. So often we talked about that they are born out of the need for love. Homosexuality, write this down. Homosexuality and lesbianism, it is the root of it is idolatry. It is idolatry, it's idolatry of self. Self can't love self, God can love you, but you must not find your, your identity in another person. It is an identity issue. When you were when there, when there were missing elements 
things, right? And that is not always, I want to step back here because sometimes when there are, when there are experiences of molestation and rape, what happens to that person's mind, going back to the mind, the will and the emotion, when a person has entered into my, if, and number one, let me slow down here. If there has been a level of sexual molestation, the mind and the brain has been smeared. It has been smeared with a level of confusion, just as if you enter into sexual intercourse and you enter into that that, that particular that that act and someone does that to you too soon your brain cannot cognitively understand that your brain cannot cognitively understand that and so what it does is it brings it attaches perversion to your soul and so what happens you get older right and you you morph and you start wondering well what's this touch and what's that touch then then what happens is you your your spirit is now open to other things does that make sense? So you're no longer understanding or your brain, your brain, though you may know, though you may know in the natural what you're supposed to do, your brain does not recognize what you are supposed to, what you're supposed to look to. You do not accurately function in that area because your brain has been damaged at an early age. And so you must go back. When that has happened, you must go back and reclaim your sexual identity. You must go back and reclaim what occurred. And and then there are times if you start to experiment with a same sex relationship, what happens is your body is now awakened to the touch of the same sex. And then you, what happened, lust is now awakened. So though you may, if you're a woman and though you may want a man and though you may want to be straight, your body only knows the touch of a woman. You don't, your, your body and your mind has not been renewed to the, to the, to the place where you can say, I can say I have an unequivocal attraction to men because I've done this so long. So this is the only thing that I know because it has become one in your mind, your will, and your emotions. And so what happens is your will says, well, this is who I am. Your will says, well, all I know is homosexuality. All I know is lesbianism. You want to break it, but your will says, this is all I know. Your emotion says, this is all I've been attracted to for the last year, for the last 10 years of my life. I've always been attracted to women or I've always been attracted to men. And so it has become one with you to the point that you believe that is who you are. Your soul has been tied up. Does that make sense? I hope I'm making sense tonight. So I want to talk about this. And you, until you, when you begin to break free from any of these things, you must first recognize that what I'm doing is a, a distorted view of God's original design. If I watch porn, that's a distorted view of God's design. God didn't intend me to watch sex. He wanted me to do it in the holiness and sanctity of marriage. He didn't intend for me to do that. If, if, if I masturbate, that was a distorted view of God's original design for sex. If I'm in a homosexual relationship, it it is distorted for what God really intended. If I'm engaged in an adultery relationship, I charge you to get your self-esteem up and say, God, then God has better for you. That was not his original design. And God ain't the God that has to bring you seconds. So if there is somewhere when you start to thinking, well, maybe this could be my man, or maybe this could be the person that God called for me when he gets divorced. Oh God, that's God saying, I don't have to bring you seconds. I can bring you the original. So you have if you if you've gone over what happens that God you you've gone over into a distorted mind he's your your mind has become reprobate the, at the point that you start thinking well maybe this can be mine when it's not really yours you become reprobate in your mind which means you become one with the thought of being in love you become one you become more one with the thought than engaging in this activity you become more one with how they you become more one with how they make you feel than the, the, than the design and the will of God for your life. Does that make sense? I hope I'm making sense tonight. So you can become one with the thought of a person. 
You spend so much time with them that, 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 that there's no thought of anybody else. That's a sign of a soul tie. You become so one with a lifestyle that there is no convincing you that this is not of God. And that's what we've seen in this culture. We've seen the flamboyancy and we've seen all of the, 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 the people that have gone over into that lifestyle. And there is no convincing them that God did not make them that way. There is no convincing them that God saved them and God wants to make them how they were actually originally born to be. There is no convincing them because they've given themselves over to a reprobate mind. This is a, And when you begin to say, this is how God made me and ain't no change in me, that's a reprobate mind. So let's talk about this. How do I know if either of these are strongholds in my life? Number one, if I'm, re if I'm reasoning with elder in any way about why I should keep this in my life, it's a stronghold. So going back, assessing, if you reasoned with me at any point and tried to say, well, it ain't like that, it ain't exactly like that, you want it to fit in your box, that means it's a stronghold. If at any point you said, through this thing, we're just friends, though we do this, we're just friends. Though I'm in an, an adulterous relationship, we're just friends. Though I talk to them for an hour, two hours a night, if you talk to, even if, if, even if in a lesbian or a homosexual relationship and you engage with them and you're saying, well, we're just friends, this is a stronghold. Are you reasoning that we have great conversations and they're a great person, I can't let them go? It's a stronghold. If the very thought of losing them makes you lose your marbles, it's a stronghold. If you have a problem not answering their calls, not entertaining them, it's a stronghold. Now, I have to give you this last but not least, give me five more minutes. Fighting through each of these things, how do I fight the stronghold? Number one, you got to ask yourself, how did I get wrapped up in this? Whether it was sex, whether it was fornication, whether it was adultery, whether it's pornography, whether it's masturbation, you have to make that assessment. Ask yourself, where did this start? How did it originate? Where did this come from? And you must ask, is it in my bloodline? Some of it is generational. Some of it is not generational. Some of it is, it a, is a door that you opened in college. Some of it is it a door that you opened in high school. Some of it is a door that you opened in middle school. Some of it, it is a door that you opened on your own. Some of it, you had, the, you had one bad experience and it traumatized you so much that it moved you into a lifestyle, whether it was promiscuity, whether it was a same-sex relationship, whether you started entertaining married people because you got so hurt by a relationship and you just didn't care no more. Some of you opened a door. Some of us opened a door somewhere, but you must ask yourself, how did I get wrapped up in this? When you can answer that question, then you take the knife and you start cutting everything that got you wrapped up in it. Deal with your soul, number two. Deal with your mind, your will, and your emotions. Sin starts in the mind. Get control of your thoughts. Put an ax to the root. We talked about that. Get Put an ax to every stimulus in your life. If that person stimulates you, you got to get rid of it. If that lifestyle stimulates you, why would you still go where everybody's hanging out at? If you know that person, that's, that's your weakness. That's going to get you caught up. That's you, if, you, if you were around them five minutes, the next five minutes, y'all going to be in the car humping. You got to get rid of the stimuli. If alcohol is your gateway drug to have sex, you need to get rid of the alcohol. 
cut off your access to it. You must go into a place. God has been dealing with me about consecration, sanctification, and holiness, and purification. You must go through a purification process, and you must pray daily, purify my mind, purify my thoughts. Even if you struggle with pornography, you might have to get the TV and the computer out your house for a while, whatever it gives you access. I'll tell you this quick story. This is one person that I know that got delivered by the, from the spirit of homosexuality. He said, I went to a cabin and I left all electronic devices at home and I stayed there for six months. And when I got back out, I walked up like a straight man. I came, I went in flamboyant and I came out a man because he got rid of the simuli. You must get rid of those vices in your life. Get rid of the people. You must wipe your house clean, the Bible says. And when you deal with real, true and deliverance, the Bible says that you can wipe your lot, your wipe your house clean. But if you don't fill it up with the word, it says it'll come that double hard. So when you dare, as you're hearing this word, and if you feel the delivering power of God, then you must go and fill yourself up with the word. Fill yourself up so that they can't come back strong to fight you because it'll always come back to test you. When you think you got delivered from the person that you kept falling with, they'll come back strong. When you thought you got delivered, it'll come back to test you. So God says you got to wipe your life clean. You got to have a fervent, fervent word life, a fervent word life. Get accountability partners. Get accountability partners. You cannot do this alone. We cannot do this alone. If you want to learn how to make it, if you want to change the very trajectory of your single life, if you want to stop making the same mistakes, if you want to get out of some relationships that you know aren't good for you, even friendships, get accountability partners, build new relationships. And let me just say this, you cannot be accountable to those who keep, giving, keep, who keep causing you to fail. You can't be in a, a full relationship talking about we love each other and we're going to hold each other accountable not to have sex. You can't hold the person that you attracted to and you love and you want to kiss and tongue and do all of that. You can't be accountable to them. If you're tempted by them, they can't be your accountability partner. You can, you can call them and say, hey, I can't see you, but you can't hold me accountable. Huh? Uproot. This is key. Renew the mind. Renew the mind. Renew the mind. Renew the mind. Whenever I feel tempted and I'm ready to do something that I thought I never wanted to do, I get in the word. I dive in. The, I find every scripture on the sin that I want to commit. You got to find the scripture on the sin and say, well, see what God says about the sin that you want to do so bad. It'll bring conviction to your soul. Your identity must be reformed into the nature of Christ. Renew your mind. The renewal of the mind happens daily. It is a daily process. It is not something you will not wake up tomorrow and say, I no longer have these feelings. You, won't, you may not wake up five or six months from now and not have these feelings, but you got to make a daily commitment to yourself. You'll know, let me give you this, you'll know when it's been broken, when the thought of it or them starts to become repulsive. You'll know when the stronghold has been broken, when the thought of it or them starts to become repulsive. And for some of us, it may not even be repulsive, it's just not, I don't desire it anymore. It's not something that you got to have. I want to give you this, just a short one. How do I come out? In short, repent, renounce, renew your mind, and repeat it every day. Repent, renounce it. I'm telling you guys, if you've never walked yourself through deliverance, I got a book. 
I take it out and I'll be like, I renounce every soul tie. I repent for my mama's mama and my daddy's daddy's, my daddy's daddy's sin. I cut off all generational curses. I repent for everything. And you have to stop and you have to repent for even the vows that you said because words have spirits on them. So when you say, I'll never leave you or we'll always be together, or we'll always be, we'll always be in each other's lives. Those words hold weight in the spirit. And so you got to say, I renounce that always because we will not always be together because you crazy and now that I'm woke now that I'm woke to the Holy Spirit I renounce the words that I told you I know I said it but I no longer mean it and you can't and, and then what that spirit will do will make you feel guilty for no longer want no longer wanting to always be there so you have to say I, I don't mean it anymore I take that out of the spirit whatever I said to you when I was crazy and drunk back then I'm no longer drunk back then I now know that that I want to be accurate. I now know I want to change. And so I don't mean those words that built ties between us. You're not my always and forever anymore. You're just not. I know I said it, but you're not anymore. Huh? You got to put that in the atmosphere. You got to tell the spirit realm that that thing has loosed you, loosed you and let you go. So you got to renounce daily and you got to open up your mouth just as loud and with authority as I'm talking to you. You have to tell it, I renounce you. I come out of agreement with whatever I thought was okay out of my brokenness. And you have to say, God, heal me. Make me whole. Make me new again. And if you pray that prayer, you cry out to God, make me whole. Make me new again. Everything that was broken from molestation to early childhood, into incest, to rape, to every same-sex relationship, God, make me whole again. Ando, all you have to do is invite him. Renounce and invite. Renounce and invite and say, God, I invite you into that part of my life. And you will feel the redeeming power of God. And remember, we said there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And repeat it every day. That's it, guys. It's 839. Repeat it every day. Any questions? Any questions? If there are no questions, we will pray out. I've held you a little bit longer than I wanted to. But if there are questions tonight, we can delve in. If not, we will we will and we can answer them another time if in fact you want to reach out to me personally you have questions i am available to answer any questions that you may have if you don't want to answer ask them openly we are available we have elders that are here um, with us watching we are available for your questions we have elder courtney we have elder lynn we have elder Britt. we have elder seward we have elder k all of us are available to answer questions. If you want deliverance in any area of your life, please reach out to us. We will walk with you. We will, we will love you through it. And we will give you truth and love. So if you have any of those questions, we are here. We are here. Again, I give you the elders' names. If you are new, Elder K, Otris Burns, Elder Courtney Spencer, Elder Seward, Jartu, um, Elder... Erlencia Mumphrey, Elder Brittany Augustus, and myself, we are here. These are sensitive topics. Don't ever feel like you can't come to us. I like to tell you, I, I think I, I've heard a lot in my life. So we're here, we can talk to you. All right, guys, I don't see any questions. Have an amazing night. I'll talk to y'all soon.